Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone, um, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is Victor Cha, Senior Vice President and Career Chair at CSIS, Vice Dean and Professor at Georgetown University. And I want to welcome you all to a special CSIS Korea platform uh, featuring uh, Congressman Ami Berra and Congressman Young Kim. Um, uh, these two individuals really don't need much of an introduction, but for the sake of uh, our recording going forward, uh, I thought it would be useful to to introduce both of them to our um, to our very large and uh, uh, distinguished audience. Um, Congressman Ami Berra has represented the California 7th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2013. Uh, he is currently member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation. Uh, he is also co-chair of the Congressional Study Group on Korea. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, the Congressional Study Group on Korea is the newest legislative exchange at FMC, the former members of Congress um, who, are, who are the co-hosts for our broadcast today, um, involving current members of Congress from both the House and the Senate in an ongoing conversation with government and elected officials in the Republic of Korea. Uh, for more than 30 years, the Congressional Study Groups have brought bipartisan groups of legislators together to discuss issues ranging from trade policy to global security. It is one of four such legislative exchanges housed at FMC. The other three are focused on Japan, Germany, and Europe. Each study group has four co-chairs uh, uh, from bipartisan, bicameral basis. Uh, and also joining us, of course, is Congressman uh, Young Kim. Congressman Kin represents California's 39th district in the U.S. House of Representatives. She is also serves as the co-chair of the Congressional Study Group on Korea with Congressman Barra. Uh, Congressman Kim started her public service as Director of Community Relations and Asian Affairs for, for former Congressman Ed Royce, where she was a key liaison to the 39th district and an advisor on issues pertaining to the Asian American community and foreign policy. Prior to serving in Congress, uh, Congresswoman Kim was the first ever Korean American Republican woman to serve in the California State Assembly. As an assembly woman, she fought to grow jobs, support small businesses, ensure public safety, promote educational opportunities, support vet veterans, and protect protect victims of domestic violence. Um, so two highly qualified, highly distinguished members of Congress joining us today uh, for this CSIS FMC broadcast. And let me just say first that we're really grateful that both of you could take the time. I know how busy you both are. Both of you could take the time to join us today. And of course, it's really good to see everybody uh, without masks on since we're doing this doing this virtually and we can see everybody's uh, everybody's smile. So again, Congressman Barrett, thank you for joining us. Congresswoman Kim, thank you for joining us today. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, you know, when we originally talked about doing this, uh, you all had just completed a very successful uh, 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 delegation uh, going to Korea. I think that was sometime in the summer, but because of scheduling and everything else, we couldn't bring us all together until, uh, now at this point, um, but I think perhaps maybe just to start us off, um, you could both give us your impressions of that trip you took. I know a lot has taken place since then, but maybe you could give us some overall impressions of the trip that you took and maybe the things that m most impressed you about the trip or left the longest lasting impression before we get into some of the other areas that we planned on talking about um, with regard to the Alliance, North Korea, all these other things. So. Um, uh, so, uh, I don't know how we, sh who, who would like to go first? <laughs> Jen, do you want me to go ahead and start and then I'll kick it over to you? Sure, yes. Okay. Yeah, one first impression is that, you know, I got a lot of coverage in Korea because we do a lot of Korea, but Young Kim is a rock star. <laughs> so, 
so so I, I had to accept my humble pie and you know, appreciate, you know, uh, yeah, I get that attention when I'm in India as an Indian American member of Congress. And you, know, you can tell the, the pride that the Korean people have in their Korean American members of Congress. So that, that, was, that was quite evident from the get go. Um, I, I'd say just quick takeaway impressions were, you know, there were times where the U.S.-Korea relationship were rocky under the prior administration, you know, going from fire and fury to, you know, um, the, the summits and, and so forth. I would say, you know, my impression was um, U.S.-Korea relationships are really at a, a high point right now. I think you had, you know, successfully um, bilaterals with uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin fairly early in the Biden administration. You had a successful Biden Moon Summit, um, which actually had some tangible takeaways. And, and you know, I think this is borne out in some of the polling data that you know, people talked about in Korea, where the Korean public's impression of the United States is really at an all time high right now. And you know, so I, I think that was a, a, a quick takeaway. I also think, you know, there are real tangibles. You know, we had a chance to visit Samsung Biologics and, and the semiconductor, and there are real areas where um, the United States and Korea are working together in the business community. Samsung, um, you know, the semiconductor business, you know, really helping us deal with some of the, the challenges and shortages that we uh, have. And I think they're ready to go to make some significant investments in the United States. And on the COVID-19 side, you know, Moderna partnering with Samsung Biologics to you know, tap into Korean innovation in the Korean pharmaceutical sector um, to help both produce um, vaccines, not just for the domestic Korean population, but also to partner together to, to help stamp out the pandemic in, in Southeast Asia and Asia in general. So um, real tangible partnership areas, and we can get into some of the areas that you know probably require some additional finesse, but let me t- turn it over to my co-chair, um, Congresswoman Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Barra. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for co-leading that bipartisan trip to Korea, and I was very, very impressed with the involvement of other uh, congressional members that were traveling with us. But I also want to take a very brief moment to thank all the staff at Congressional Study Group for, on Korea for their excellent preparation. And I also want to thank you, uh, Dr. Cha, and everyone at CSIS for the support that you've given us. Prior to our uh, trip, you had given us all the members uh, pre-briefing so we can see what to expect. But uh, before I talk about my impression, again, the one key takeaway is that as someone who was born and raised in South Korea until I uh, finished my elementary school, and uh, you know, during all those years I worked in the United States and as a longtime congressional staff, I had the opportunity to go back to Korea on numerous occasions, but this was very first time traveling back as an elected member of Congress with my colleagues and Congressman Barra, and uh, the, the, the warmth and the warm uh, welcome that my motherland have provided to us was something that I will always remember. And of course, the good food. <laughs> One thing I missed was, oh my God, being able to go to, um, you know, uh, Myeongdong and other places. I mean, we did take our uh, congre- I mean, Codell members there, but because of COVID, we hardly saw anybody, not like the previous visits that we've had. So we didn't have the opportunity to eat those uh, dokguk, odeng, and all those street foods that, you know, people go to Korea for. So I really missed that, but I know the Korea is still vibrant, and there is no doubt in our minds that uh, Korea is one of the most vibrant uh, economy uh, and has uh, really uh, grown to be what it is today because of the South Korea and the Koreans, uh, you know, resiliency uh, of uh, being able to weather through some of the tough times in uh, in their uh, lives. But um, again, having said that. Really, I thought our trip to Korea in July was very productive and valuable. And during our trip, we were able to meet with many of our counterparts in South Korea. Uh, we were very blown away with the um, uh, 
the high level uh, members of the South Korean government, the military officials, industry leaders, as Congressman Amibera just mentioned, being able to visit with and tour some of the very high tech uh, businesses like Samsung, Hyundai, you know, this was very, uh, you know, helpful for us to understand that the South Korea US alliance is very strong and we have obviously we we also found some ways to improve our partnership and advance our shared priorities but i'm glad that our delegation was also able to continue personally for me which is very important to uh, revive the dialogue and cooperation between the united states and south korea including the the reestablishment or resuming uh, the us south korea interparliamentary exchange between members of congress and the members of the korean national assembly and during that meeting uh, during our trip. Actually, we had the opportunity to sit down and have a roundtable discussion with our counterparts at the National Assembly. There were eight of them to welcome eight of us. And we had uh, conversations and we were able to identify shared priorities in the bilateral alliance. And we discussed paths forward on our trade relationship, denuclearization of North Korea, promoting shared action on North Korea human rights issues, among other things. So there were, I was really, really glad that uh, I can say in one thing, sum it up, our trip was very productive and valuable. It was it was productive. Value. The timing of it also was quite important following on from the May 21 May 21 summit. You also the president also President Moon also hosted you. Is that correct? Yes. For a, yes. For a meeting. Um, how did that meeting go? So um, w I wish we had more time in an open uh, setting to have more conversation and have the uh, the media continue to stay with us. But we we were able to speak openly. Uh, when President um, Moon welcomed us uh, with the media present, and I took that as an opportunity to raise an issue that was very important for me personally, and as was with the rest of the delegation. This was a time when we knew that there were, uh, you know, at least dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of North Korean refugees that are currently residing or hiding out uh, on China area. So uh, since because of the COVID, the border between China and North Korea is shut down. So I took it as an opportunity to raise an issue to uh, ask uh, Moon administration and President Moon directly, I appealed to him to uh, use any channels, back channels or whatever the means possible to communicate with the uh, uh, Chinese government to allow these North Korean refugees, especially I was more concerned about the Christian families uh, because of their belief you know what will happen if they were repatriated back to North Korea. So I raised that issue and he personally um, promised that he will follow up. Uh, he asked me to go back to uh, United States and continue to follow up on this issue. So uh, I really hope that uh, while we have this short, small window of opportunity, that we will do everything we can, use all of our diplomatic channels to ensure the safe passage of the North Korean refugees to South Korea, because that's where they want to go. This is the country they know. This is where they are brothers and sisters. This is the culture, environment, language they are comfortable with. So I think more than coming to the United States, they will want to settle in South Korea. And I really hope that that happens with the help of uh, our South Korean government. Victor, I'd probably briefly just add, you know, had a chance to meet with President Moon on prior trips to, to Korea. He was awfully generous with his time. You know, he gave us a, a fair amount of time. He allowed all the members to interact. And, you know, clearly um, with the elections coming up in Korea, you know, he has some things that he'd like to, to see move f faster before the end of his term. It was both clear in our meetings with President Moon, but also with his cabinet members, a resumption of dialogue with North Korea is seen as a legacy item. And you know, yeah. that's one where... You know, we may have pushed back a little bit to say let's we're open to the dialogue, but let's make sure we don't move too fast. And you know, if we do go in that direction, that it's uh, done on you know in a manner that we're also getting some victories as well. That it's not just given away as a luxury. That's one that you know we've communicated to the Biden administration that we ought to just pay close attention to in these last few months before the you know Korea goes into election mode. Right. So can I, uh, I yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff on the table and I'd like to get back to North Korea, but I'd like to start, uh, pick up from uh, where both of you 
uh, left left off with regard to um, the state of the alliance, because I think we all agree that it's oh my gosh, it's in a much better place today than it was, you know. I mean, when we were talking about this, um, you know, even a year ago, I mean, um, it was just in such a horrible state. Um, and so, you know, the May 21 summit, your visit. Um, so I think we all agree the state of the relationship is good. Um, uh, I, I mean, particularly in your remarks, you made reference to some of the things that we need to continue to work on and follow um, in terms of the alliance relationship. And, uh, you know, maybe I could ask you to sort of elaborate on that a little bit. That would be that'd be terrific. Yeah. So I, I think, again, it was a very successful presidential summit. You know, at the time we were there in early July, you know, President Moon was scheduled to, to visit Japan for the, the Olympics. Obviously, that trip didn't pan out. And now we're seeing, you know, um, Japan will have its own leadership elections and, you know, what happens there. We did have you know, a lot of conversation about the trilateral um, relationship, the importance of, you know, perhaps separating historic issues that have to be dealt with between J Korea and Japan from the geopolitical, strategic, economic issues that I think are in all of our interests. I think we had good conversations there, and I think that plays uh, along with the two-by-two two dialogues that have taken place earlier, as well as you know, conversations between the Biden and Moon administration. But there's still work to be done on you know, smoothing the, the, the relationship with, with Japan. I do have some worries that, you know, again, for legacy purposes, that the, the Moon administration may move too quickly. And we've seen gestures to res resume talks with North Korea, even as North Korea goes to some back to some saber rattling and, and so forth. That is not conducive to saying let's um, resume dialogue. Um, so, yeah, I think there's still pieces to, to work on. Um, yeah, I do have some concerns about the Moon administration perhaps moving too fast and, you know, a resumption of dialogue. And, you know, again, you know, I think the Korea-Japan relationship is at a better place than it was a few years ago, but there's still work to be done here as well between our two friends. Yeah. Um, you know, if I may, let me just talk. I know... Um, Ami um, talked about a lot of issues and uh, even went to Japan-Korea relations. And I want to address that, but let me first address the U.S.-Korea uh, alliance uh, since uh, Dr. Chai, you mentioned it. As uh, both uh, Ami and I agree, I believe that, uh, and you stated that too, our uh, U.S.-South Korea alliance is probably strong and more friendly than ever. But um, I agree with Ami that there are definitely areas we can move or if we can improve on, on both sides. Uh, first of all, in our meeting with the president and with our counterparts and government officials, a lot of issues were dealt with, but uh, even President Moon talked about the, the, the trading, uh, trade issues. You know, South Korea remains uh, one of our um, largest trading partners in uh, 10 years after implementation of Korea uh, FTA. You know, we all, refer to it as the gold standard for trade agreements globally, and it has greatly strengthened our bilateral economic relationship over the past decade, but there is still much to improve. So this is where the uh, President Moon also mentioned, and I also, along with Ami and many other uh, Congress members, I joined uh, Congressman uh, uh, Connolly in introducing that uh, Partner with Korea Act that would create an allotment of like 15,000 E4 highly skilled work visas for Korean nationals with specialized education and expertise. Remember, um, I think we all agree that we saw similar visa allotments where uh, we passed trade agreements with other countries like Australia, Singapore, uh, even Canada. They got the uh, highly skilled work visas with the passage of free trade agreement, but not with the case of Korea FTA, which is why I fully support this partner with Korea Act and then uh, give additional visa categories. This is, uh, you know, something that I think it's important for us to expand our relationship and benefit both of our countries, uh, especially um, because South Korea is one of our most important allies and is home to highly skilled and diverse workforce, right? So we must treat them like the strong partner that they are and leverage that uh, cross FTA. Um, I also believe that we 
have the security side of our alliance. Uh, while it's strong, I think uh, on North Korea, I believe our alliance must continue to press for the complete, verifiable, and irrespons uh, irreversible uh, denuclearization of Korea. And also, I'm very big on prioritizing human rights and humanitarian crisis in our bilateral approach to North Korea. And so, this is one of the uh, way the reasons why on our side, on the U.S. side, I've been pushing Biden administration all year long. I mean, from our very first House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee meetings, when Secretary Blinken came before us, I've been pressing this administration and Secretary Blinken to appoint a special envoy on North Korea human rights issues, because this was required by the law that we passed in the North Korea Human Rights Act in 2004, and that's been uh, reauthorized three times already, as far as I remember. So finally, um, I think we are, uh, you know, and I stand ready to work with South Korean on issues important to the uh, alliance on the domestic front. Uh, there are some areas where I disagree with certain policies that have been advanced in the National Assembly in South Korea including the Media Arbitration Act or anti lift law, you know, as well as the religious freedoms in that country. But I think in uh, many of us, my colleagues in Congress uh, and the United Nations have shared their concerns as well. That's, that's great. That's a great rundown of some of the key issues. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and they're all they're all very important ones. And I, again, I want to dig dig a little bit more down on, on North Korea in a minute. But before we move on to North Korea and off the alliance, um, I, I, I feel I, I should ask you, since um, uh, since everything these days is about not about Korea, but about another country in Central Asia. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I, I know that um, with what has happened in Afghanistan and the U.S. pullout, I've gotten questions from reporters and others in Korea about what this means for U.S. security commitments to other countries, including uh, treaty allies like South Korea, when they look at all the money and time and political capital that was invested in Afghanistan and, and to see it end this way. Um, perhaps I could get both of your views on this on this question. I mean, I, I know a lot of our audience that are that are watching this from Korea would have the same question about, you know, how, how do you think that this reflects on or does it reflect on the credibility of U.S. security commitments to other uh, allies, treaty allies like South Korea. So maybe, uh, Congressman Barra, if I could ask you to go first. Yeah. Sure. I, you know, to the audience in Korea, I would tell them not to read in too deeply into the decision by President Biden to withdraw out of Afghanistan. You know, while it was two decades of you know trying to help Afghanistan you know, develop its democracy and you know it, its own resources. I think it was also a decision by the Biden administration to let Afghanistan you know, try to, to, to fly on its own. You know, Korea is a totally different country. It's one of the most developed democracies in, in the world. It's certainly a, a developed economy. Um, we have a long geopolitical strategic relationship, and our security commitments are extremely um, important to members of Congress in a bilateral way. And again, I think we've seen that from Democratic presidents as well as Republican presidents. You know, the, the commitment to the region is, is you know, probably more important than ever because of that that other, um, you know, Asian nation that's a neighbor to, to others. You know, China, you know, certainly as we look at the, the various values and so forth, um, the geopolitical importance of East Asia is, you know, not lost on, on anyone. So I would tell audiences in Korea as well as domestic audiences here that you know, Afghanistan was a you know certainly a different um, type of engagement than the long-term commitments that we've shown over decades to, to Korea and, and the region. Sure. Thank if I may add, yeah, I'll add very quickly. So you know, with what's happening uh, with Afghanistan and the way that we pulled uh, our U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, and the world is watching us and our leadership, and they are concerned. And so it is a valid question whether or not Korea should be concerned. But let me first say this: um, this um, the question is not whether or not we should have pulled out U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. I think the question and concern is how we pulled out 
our troops out of Afghanistan, leaving hundreds of uh, Americans and even the Afghan partners behind. We are still trying to get them out even after August 31 deadline has come and gone. So my office has been working around the clock since uh, you know, Taliban took over. So we're still talking about this. We're still working with the troops on the ground. We're still uh, working with uh, many organizations, including the civilians and former generals working on this. So with that, I think that the, the way that we pulled out and many people are expressing concern. My district, is, which is a very diverse so I talked to a lot of Vietnamese Americans in my district uh, in Southern California, and they are telling us that we, we are reliving the fall of Saigon uh, about 50 years ago, and uh, they are just concerned about our leadership in the world. And I'm talking to the Taiwanese American community, and they're uh, asking questions like, is Taiwan next? And I'm talking to a very large Korean American population here, and they're concerned that the, the United States, when we made a promise to our allies, we need to keep that promise. But I'm hearing from my conversation, and again, this is coming from all communities, especially the, the immigrant community, especially those who fled communism, those who came here after the fall of Saigon and so forth, and they're really concerned. Can we trust United States leadership in the world? I think what happened just now in the last few weeks, in the last month or so, what we've seen is the our U.S. leadership, our world, uh, America standing in the world has been uh, kind of uh, going uh, eroding, I must say, to be honest with you. But despite all these challenges, I have to say America is strong. We're going to come out of this. We still have the leadership in the world. We will. We will show that United States uh, can lead, and I would like to also echo my colleague, um, you know, Congressman uh, Ami Barra's comments that my friends in Korea, my Korean American community, and uh, those who are watching, um, the United States commitment and our presence in South Korea. We are there as a deterrence to any potential conflict in the Korean Peninsula. We will be there. And I, I, I really want to assure you, as long as Ami Bera and I are in Congress, uh, serving as co-chairs of the Congressional Study Group, as uh, members and co-chair of the U.S.-Korea Interparliamentary Exchange Group, we will be there to lend our voice and be your advocate. And please trust us, United States can lead and we will lead once again and show that we can come out of this difficult challenges. Thank you very much for, the, for those comments, both of you. Um, now, now, maybe we should just, um, uh, time is moving very quickly here, um, but maybe we should talk a little bit more about the, the North Korea situation. Um, you know, very, very clearly, um, uh, the administration has, uh, you know, made some overtures to North Korea. They haven't been responded to. As both of you have said, you, uh, there was a clear message from the Moon government that they want to try to make progress, uh, want to try to do really anything they can to try to make some progress in talks. Um, um, but the North Koreans don't seem to be responding. So I guess I have two questions. The first is, why is it that you think that the North Koreans are not responding to overtures from the United States or from South Korea, or I don't know, maybe even from China for that matter, why, why is it the case? And also, wh what would you advise the administration to do at this point? Because um, they seem to be saying, look, we're knocking on the door. We're happy to meet anytime, any place. And the North Koreans don't seem to be answering answering the, the phone, to mix my metaphors. So um, 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 so uh, perhaps uh, Congressman Bear, maybe you'd like to start? Yeah, I, you know, it's hard to get a good read on what's happening inside North Korea. You know. Given the, the COVID situation, given you know, malnutrition, the harsh economic challenges that they face, you know, e even speculation on um, you know what's happening within the leadership, you know, with Kim Jong Un with his sister, you know, are there, you know, what's the stability of um, you know, of Kim's health, um, et cetera. So those could all be factors um, at play here. Um, I, I think I. Th I think the, the factors and, and the reason they're not, you know, returning to, to dialogue, even with the the, the real open um, overtures by the Moon administration, is 
internal domestic challenges. And again, yeah, that could be COVID, that could be economic. And, and you know, again, I don't want to speculate on stability of the re- regime or, or not. I, I think he, he'd be reluctant to re-engage with a weak hand um, at this juncture. I also think, you know, if I, I can't speak for the Biden administration, but I, I think it's a challenging time to re- re-engage in dialogue given um, the proximity of the Korean um, elections coming up. And, you know, you can start to lay some of the table and do some of that. But I think, you know, as politics in the United States play out, I'm pretty sure Korean politics and Korean elections are a pretty competitive sport as well. So I think that's coming up very, very quickly. And I think it's a, it would be a dangerous time to start a dialogue. Yeah. You know, uh, for me personally, I mean, I've always been a, a, a proponent of having conversation. Even when you hate somebody so bad, if you can come together and have a conversation, you can, you know, like uh, elevate a lot of the tensions and, uh, you know, resolve some, uh, you know, uh, situation uh, through the dialogue. But when it comes to North Korea, it's really hard to say when North Korea will come back to the table uh, as they have demonstrated their ability to surprise us before. And it's it's really hard to predict what uh, North Korea will do. You know, a couple of things that uh, we can do, or uh, I guess it just come to mind is that one, uh, with respect to uh, sanctions, I don't believe in relaxing sanctions just for Kim Jong-un to come back to the table. We tried that approach before. And it's led to a rogue a nuclear regime that has used its power to oppress its people for decades. So in order to move towards partial sanctions relief, um, I would like to see serious signs from North Korea that is that it's willing to move forward with reforms and denuclearization. And human rights, as I mentioned, I mean, something that I, I consistently talk about, that human rights should remain a core element of our combined approach to North Korea. If we cannot rely on Kim regime to respect basic human rights for its own people, it's hard to see how they could be trusted to maintain any comprehensive and binding agreement. So U.S. and South Korea should work together to ensure that any humanitarian aid that we send or consider sending uh, into North Korea is used to support their North Korean people, not to prop up their uh, malign regime. And we shouldn't waver in maintaining that sanctions pressure on Kim regime to bring the regime back into compliance in the long run. Um, Again, I think for all these reasons that I mentioned, I think it's really important that US, Korea, interparliamentary exchange that I talked about earlier, I think it can serve as a great platform and can be used as a great influence on that process, especially for debating and discussing options to bring North Korea back into negotiation. And I think the members of that uh, interparliamentary exchange group can represent a broad uh, political spectrum, as we've already seen, because this is a bipartisan effort. And I'm confident that if we can forge consensus here, then it will have a positive impact on our overall bilateral approach to North Korea. You, could I ask um, to follow on from what uh, one point that Congresswoman Kim raised about humanitarian assistance to North Korea? And if I, I could throw it back to Ami, I, the, the, um, um, I mean, if there's one thing that every world leader wakes up in the morning and cares about these days, it's the COVID situation. And, you know, clearly, you know, North Korea's border has been closed. I mean, Congresswoman Kim mentioned this. It's been what now? 19 months it's been closed. Um, do you, I mean, what do you think about, um, is that at least tactically one lever that the U.S. can pull sort of on the humanitarian side? Um, and whether that, I know that the, the North Koreans have not been open to Chinese vaccines, uh, apparently, but uh, what do you think about that, Congressman Barra? Yeah. Certainly. I think, um, you know, for lack of a better way of describing a vaccine diplomacy, providing vaccines to the North could be a, a door opener to, to, to dialogue. And, you know, certainly I know that the COVAX facility has you know, wanted to, to, to engage there as well. The challenge being that they also want to make sure the vaccines are getting distributed to the, to the masses. And you know, North Korea's reluctance to allow folks and observers to come into to North Korea has been a bit of a sticking point. 
That said, you know, again, just putting my doctor hat on, until we vaccinate the world, we don't defeat COVID. So that includes North Korean's population as well. And from a humanitarian perspective, certainly um, providing vaccine and, and U.S. vaccines, yeah, I think, could be really important. Great. Terrific. Um, so the, um, because there are a number of questions coming in and they're coming in from all over, they're coming in from Europe and Korea and all over the place. Um, uh, and it's actually in line with our next uh, topic, which is um, uh, the whole question of China. Um, there are some who perceive that the Moon government has taken a, you know, for lack of a better term, a more, much more of a pro-China stance than we've seen in the past, at a particular time when the United States really has been um, focusing on, in a whole of government perspective, focusing on the strategic competition with China. Um, perhaps we could, I could get your views on um, what were your impressions uh, when you talked with folks in the Moon administration about policy towards China, and also what what choice? I mean, what choice uh, do you think that Korea? I mean, these are hard choices, but what would you advise them to do? I mean, whether we're talking about 5G or free and open Indo-Pacific or um, you know investigation on the origins of COVID, national security law in Hong Kong. These are things that you know many countries have weighed in on, but it's much more difficult for Korea. So I'd love to get um, your and and our audience would love to get your views on on that one in particular. Um, uh, maybe uh, Congresswoman Kim, would you like to start or? Sure. Uh, specific to your question regarding uh, China, I think um, we need to recognize that uh, South Korea faced very difficult consideration given its uh, geographical proximity and economic reliance on the mainland. Um, and we understand that uh, South Korea rely heavily on uh, China for its uh, economic and trade relations, as is the Nor uh, United States with them too. But, you know, for us House Republicans, uh, we hope that uh, policymakers with South Korea will realize that their long-term interests are best served by working with the United States and hold China accountable for its destabilizing behavior, their unfair trade practices, and their sponsorship of genocide. As you know, we're talking specifically about the Uyghur population. I even have, I'm a co-sponsor of the Uyghur Policy Act and uh, others, and calling uh, China's treatment of a Uyghur population a genocide. You know, so these are some of the things that we need to bring to light and really uh, keep China accountable uh, as a close alliance forged in blood and years of goodwill. Our two countries, United States, South Korea, we share a strong bond and we share uh, values that speak to the strength of our relationship. So we should recognize that and stand strong against those that seek to undermine those values. That's uh, my thoughts on China. But again, um, you know, Ami has probably additional thoughts. Yeah, you, um, I think just playing off of Congresswoman Kim, a message that you know we certainly delivered to the Koreans, which I, I think is how the Koreans are looking at it. It's not a question of the United States or China. You know, given the geographic proximity. Um, Korea is going to have a relationship with both countries, a trading relationship, and you know, obviously has a historic relationship um, you know, with, with Korea. That said, I, I think we emphasize the point that this is also um, you know, a battle of ideas with regards to values. And you know, the, the two countries, the United States and Korea, value free markets, value open competition, have values of democracy. And you know, Congresswoman Kim touched on human rights, um, intellectual property, freedom of navigation, freedom of movement, uh, goods and services, and maritime securities. Those are all values that, uh, that are very important to, to you know, not just the United States, but also to Korea, but also to many of the countries in the region. You know, I, I don't think Korea wants to formally enter you know, quad plus one type of relationship, but I think Korea as, a, again, a developed um, mature democracy, you know, one of the leading markets and economies in the world can play a role in, in you know, as this quad coalition kind of matures, you know, particularly around COVID um, vaccinations development. So 
you know, I, I, I am very conscious of the fine line that Korea has to navigate. But I also, you know, if you look at the Korean public and look at polling, China polls worse than Japan right now. And I think there's a real angst amongst the Korean population towards China that you know certainly goes back to the heavy-handed approach they had when the THAAD batteries that we deployed were there for um, South Korea's self-defense purposes. It'll yeah. really be seen what happens. You know, South Korea you know tries to move to develop its own defensive capabilities for its own protection. You know, I just you know saw the reports that you know their, their indigenous submarine you know you know testing uh, its missile capabilities. Those are again for you know. I don't think any of us anticipate South Korea has any offensive ambitions. Those are for defensive capabilities to defend their homeland, and I think those are perfectly acceptable. I, I can certainly see a Chinese overreaction to say, well, you can't do that. And again, I, I think that's you know, totally inappropriate on China's and, and certainly support South Korea's ability to defe- develop its own defensive capabilities. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's an important, I mean, there is, there does appear to be a gap between the the policies of the government and where the public is on China. Um, and it's a, it's a larger gap, I think, than we've seen in quite some time, I think. And so I don't know if that's something that's eventually going to be worked out in the upcoming election. Um, maybe there'll be a national debate on this issue as a part of the upcoming election, but it seems to me Korea has not had that national debate about China yet. I mean, they've clearly had it on Japan many times. They, so. may, be, they may be avoiding that, right? Yeah, that could be, <laughs> that could be true too. But, you know, with respect to, again, just sum up uh, what uh, Congressman Berra and I have been saying about our relationship with China. I think in order to uh, work closely with China or to hold China accountable, uh, I believe that Congress and President Biden should make every effort to strengthen the trilateral U.S.-South Korea-Japan alliance, as well as our bilateral South Korea and Japan relationship, uh, because I think that is very important. And I know Congressman Berra earlier talked about the South Korea and Japan relationship, which I totally agree with him. We have a complicated history that continues to this day, historical, territorial, you know, wartime recognition and responsibility, these remain as important, as relevant as ever, right? But as democratic nations that all share the same core values and seek to protect the international rules-based order, I think we must come together as one to face those dangers that threaten to undermine our collective security. And on that note, uh, we've known, uh, you know, South Korea is not a member of the Quad, but, um, it's not just to counter security national threats from China. We've seen through the COVID era, or as we are dealing with COVID, uh, we have come together to address this issue and how do we combat and to be better prepared for another pandemic like this one that we've just experienced. So for that reason, uh, I, I strongly uh, ask my counterparts in South Korea to consider maybe joining the Quad or make it a five nation uh, you know, platform or something. Great, terrific. Yeah, all all great points. I don't think there's any disagreement. Certainly on trilateral, I think every, all of us agree it's important. Um, we only have time for one last uh, round, and I wanted to just give you both an opportunity to talk about um, your your home constituencies, um, and uh, you know how engaged do you find them on these issues. But I mean, I I know, for example, you know you're both from California, a large Korean American community out there. Um, how engaged do you find them on these issues, um, and uh, and what are the things that interest them? So uh, maybe uh, uh, who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go and start, and I'll let Congresswoman Kim okay. close, because she has the larger um, diaspora <laughs> than, than I do. Um, yeah. I, I know, you know when we came back from a trip, I um, was doing a, a, a public event, um, and I had my Korean-American um, Diaspora come up holding their Korean American newspaper, which had a picture of us meeting with with President. Yeah. I think there's a level of pride that they have that they're, you know, and I'm sure Congresswoman Kim feels the same way that their member of Congress is, is out there uh, re- representing, but also um, showing the importance of, of that relationship. So I, I think it, it matters. I think you know when we talk about the the partnership between the two countries. Um, 
which really is a partnership now because um, Korean companies are going to help us address our um, semiconductor shortage in, in not a small way. I think you'll see really big um, Korean business investment in the United States to create jobs here and help shore up some of our national um, security issues. And then vice versa, you know, that U.S. companies are partnering with Korean companies. Um, and, and I think from that end, when I talk to our business community, they're very interested in you know, bringing additional Korean businesses to, to California, but also to the United States. So while it may not be the driving issue with my, you know, I think the driving issue is getting kids back in school, getting businesses open and, and getting past the pandemic. It's not a, for, certainly for a Californian, you know, the relationship between the two countries is pretty vibrant. Yeah. Carson and Kim? For me, um, because I'm in Southern California and I do have one of the large uh, Korean American as constituents in my district, which make up like Asian Americans make up about one third of my uh, congressional district. So they pay a lot of attention. This is probably the second largest Asian population in my district, Korean Americans after Chinese Americans. So um, they pay a lot of attention with what's going on especially more so than what's going on here in domestic where they reside. This is their home, but more so in Korea. Uh, they pay attention to uh, the local politics, the domestic politics, what the National Assembly is working on, the bills that they're passing. Uh, but again, you know, that is not to discount the fact that they pay attention to what's going on in their new home called America. Uh, we are definitely concerned about all of us getting back to, uh, you know, I mean, opening schools safely, uh, you know, making sure that our small businesses are thriving, uh, making sure that as federal government and state government officials that we work on policies to help them get to where they need to be in order to remain uh, open with their, uh, you know, businesses so they can continue to live their American dream. But part of that includes a large Korean American population in my area paying attention to uh, some of the legislation that affect them and affect Korea, their motherland. And so one thing that they constantly talk to me about is the the peace on the Korean Peninsula legislation that's been uh, introduced and it's uh, moving through its congressional process. Uh, I don't think it has gotten out of the committee yet. Uh, it's just collecting uh, co-sponsors. You know, I'm very passionate about working towards making a unified Korea possible one day. And as a Korean American myself, this is a very, very personal issue to me. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'm sure the audience listening uh, know what it is, but Quickly, this Peace on Korean Peninsula Act calls on United States to actively pursue peace negotiations with North Korea to formally end hostilities between North and South Korea and the United States. But as you know, this you, you cannot just call for the end of the Korean War or end the hostility in the Korean Peninsula just passing uh, legislation, right? Uh, because on that end, uh, so I've been having a lot of conversation and I have... Uh, a lot of uh, talks with various groups that address this issue, like the Pyeongtong members, which is the unification advisory members that is uh, appointed by South Korean president. So the current members tend to uh, listen and read the information that's coming out of the current administration, whoever is occupying the Blue House. So this one particular legislation seem to have picked a lot of their interests. But for me personally, I believe the bill does nothing to recognize the current reality that we face on the Korean Peninsula, because it does not reflect the fact that the Kim regime has restarted its nuclear weapons production facilities. It does not reflect that the people of North Korea continue to face unspeakable violence, abuse, or sexual exploitation at the hands of the state and party officials. It does not reflect that North Korea continues to do everything within its power to undermine the international rules-based order in its illicit dealings with China and partnership, you know, with rogue regimes. So I think this was also that uh, one area uh, that I raised issue when I visited, uh, when we took the uh, CODEL to Korea in July, uh, and when we visited the, um, the DMZ and had our conversation with our U.S. troops, uh, and also uh, uh, commending General uh, La Camara, uh, we raised this issue and I asked for their view on how it would affect the state of play between North and South. And the officers 
they replied that the bill would do nothing to bring North Korea back to the table in a constructive way and certainly not lead to long-term progress with the Kim regime. Some even went as far as to say that it would actively harm our leverage and standing against North Korea and that the legislation's good intention was seriously misguided. So I had the opportunity to talk about this one particular legislation, and I'm glad that uh, I'm able to express how I feel about this uh, at this forum too. But again, to your question, Dr. Cha, about how engaged your Korean American constituency is, this conversation alone, this one issue alone, would uh, exhibit how involved they are and uh, the policies, the legislation, domestic, foreign, uh, about what's happening uh, that would affect Korea and Korean American community. Great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Congressman Murray, do you have a quick comment on this piece on Korea Peninsula Act or? No, or, other or, than, you know, I, I've always been open to trying to engage in dialogue and, and move forward. Again, I just as stated previously, I think it becomes difficult as you get closer to the elections and you know, we really have to have a long term strategy to, to, to finding peace and stability on the peninsula. Great. Well, that that uh, is about all the time that we have. It's been an absolute pleasure to have both of you uh, join us today. This was a wonderful discussion. We covered off you know, the full gamut of issues in great detail, expert detail as well. So uh, Congresswoman Kim, um, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my only regret is that we can't host you uh, in the building at CSIS, but that will come at some point soon. Uh, Congressman Barra, it's always a pleasure uh, to work with you and it's always good to see you again. Uh, thank you again for joining us at CSIS. And so on behalf of CSIS and former members of Congress, we wanna thank our audience for joining. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again soon on our next Korea Platform broadcast. So thank you both very much again. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you.